So here's what I'd like to do um, a little bit today is do a little bit of a boot camp of compression itself. And then I want to really get into Pro C2 and show a lot of different possibilities. Let me start this by saying that Pro C2 is the best compressor. It's the best digital plugin technical compressor that I think that, that, that is available, in my opinion. It, it, it's the most intelligently designed and it's the cleanest sounding. And, you know, in our school, when it comes to compression, we're really looking at sort of like two kinds of compressors, right? We have musical compressors and we have technical compressors. And an example of a musical compressor would be something like this, right? A, a UAD 1176. And this one is kind of on the fence because it's a little bit musical and it's a little bit technical. There are some compressors that are even more just musical and not technical at all. And and the difference is musical compressors are usually modeled after, after classic analog gear and they have a level of saturation to them. They usually have some really quirky designs. They'll be missing stuff. They won't have an attack and release or they won't have a ratio or they won't have a threshold. And so we use them, but they've been around for 40, 50, 60 years sometimes. And we use them because uh, of the sound of the circuitry, the, the, the saturation, and also because that they're musical. They, they kind of roll with the music. They're non-linear usually, which means that even though they're single band compressors, they tend to compress different parts of the input signal of the frequency in in these very classic musical kind of ways you know so so we love our musical compression and we love our tape compression we're big fans of that and the first thing that we do typically is we will saturate and we'll either saturate with sound toys decapitator or we'll saturate with uh, a tape compressor, uh, a tape machine of some kind. Do a little bit of tape saturation, some tape compression. And usually after that, we will do some musical compression, which would be 1176, LA-2A, DBX-160, maybe Fairchild, who knows? Something, you know, very simple, LA-3A. And after that, usually there is an, an instance of reductive EQ, Right, our first level, our first EQ is reductive, and we're just taking out frequencies. If the sound has lots and lots of problems to it, we might do that before saturation, um, but but usually that's what happens. And then after that comes our technical compressor, and as I said, to you know the best technical compressor that I've ever seen is this Pro C2. Um, I don't think anything on the market, in my opinion comes close to well they really thought of everything and they made it very visual and they also made it musical and you know actually very versatile so let's take a look here at um the layout of this new pro c2 and it is my opinion that if you become a master of pro c2 it will change your life if you just dedicate some time to getting really, 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 really good at this one plugin, you will, your productions will come up in in quality and in power. There's no question to me. So, you know, those who were here last week when we looked at Pro MB, uh, realized that within these Dynamics tools, there's really sort of like four tools in the Pro MB, right? There's upward compression. There's downward compression, there's upward expansion, and there's downward expansion. And I hope, hopefully people spend a bit of the week uh, just practicing when upward compression would be good, when downward expansion would be good, upward expansion. And of course it's multiband. So that, that, we don't have that here in Pro C2. Pro C2 is a compressor, but when we say it's a compressor, it's a downward compressor. Really, that's, that's what it is in its essence. What does that mean, a downward compressor? Well, a downward compressor means that as the signal uh, crosses the threshold, 
the dynamics tool turns it down right if once the once the signal you know crosses the threshold exceeds the threshold the the com the compressor turns it down and it is not just to be clear it's not multiband right this is single band so it turns the entire signal down that's what that's what this downward compressor does so let's look for a second at some of the different sort of uh, things that are the basics of compression and we will start here with threshold and i know everybody knows this so it's a little bit of a repetition but this will also be a cool video where you can look back and sort of clarify anything that might be hazy and then we'll move on to some more advanced stuff so what threshold what is threshold threshold is the sensitivity control below which no downward compression happens no gain reduction happens and above which the compressor knows that there's something to do that is threshold and attack is the reaction time of the compressor once the threshold is you know exceeded then the attack time is the amount of time it takes for the gain reduction to start to kick in and the release is of course uh once the signal has fallen below the threshold the amount of time it takes for the compressor to stop to, to begin to, to to stop turning it down essentially uh and the ratio of course is an expression uh of the gain reduction where the amount of allowed the the amount of the increase in signal that's allowed becomes a ratio or a sort of a uh a fraction of the intention and we'll talk about all this and then of course there's makeup gain makeup gain being you know with all this turning down that's happening with downward compression we're losing signal so that there is a gain stage after all this dynamic turning up and down by the voltage controlled amplifier uh there's a static gain at addition to kind of level it out for you okay so again just looking at these basics here threshold sensitivity parameter it's a voltage detector below which no gain reduction takes place and above which compression is activated uh the attack is time-based so it's the amount of time that it takes the compressor to start compressing once the threshold has been upwardly crossed it's the reaction time of the compressor and just to be super clear if you want something more compressed in terms of the transients you want a faster attack time right if you want something to be more percussive you want a slower attack time so if you wanted to to if you want to have induce more compression and control and make things less percussive in terms of the initial transients you want a fast attack time the release is also time-based um, and it's the amount of time that the compressor takes to stop doing gain reduction once the threshold has been downwardly crossed so so the threshold if if the attack is really an adjustment of the of the initial of the percussive transients of a signal then the release is your control for the sustain of a signal and if you want something more compressed it's the opposite of the attack you want a long release a long release creates more compression a fast release lets go quicker and it creates a less compressed signal that's also more dynamic a little more bouncy in the sustain right so it's sort of a sustained control in in hiding in a way the ratio um is a is is the severity of the compression once it crosses the threshold and the attack time has been achieved and the gain reduction kicks in how much gain reduction 
right? So, and, and it always is an expression of the intention <coughs> and the actual, excuse me, and the actual amount it's allowed to go up. So if you have a two to one ratio and the signal wants to go four dB above the threshold, uh, the two to one ratio will only allow it to go two dB up. So that's the thing, right? It's still allowing it to exceed the threshold and to be dynamically expressive, but it's cutting it in half, right? That's what a two to one ratio is. Um, and a four to one ratio, if it wants to go four dB above threshold, it only allows it to go up one dB. So that's, that's more strict, right? Or a four to one ratio, and it, by two to one ratio, uh, four D, if it wants to go four dB above the threshold with a two to one ratio, it only allows it to go up two dB. So, so now within the world of ratios, uh, it's good to think of them as, as light, medium, and, hard, and hard, high ratios. Light, medium, and high, I guess. So uh, gentle ratios is 1.5 to 1 or 3 to 2. And that's very, very often seen in mastering compressors and in bus compression on fancier things. A 1.5 to 1 or a 3 to 2 is typically the lowest uh, ratio. Uh, then we move to 2 to 1, which we said is sort of decreases the, the increase in gain above the threshold by 50%. 2 to 1, and it's a light ratio. It still can be quite transparent. And it still also keeps quite a bit of the dynamics. Um, 2.5 is a great ratio to use. Uh, it's light, but it's a little bit stronger than 2 to 1. And it's very, very musical. It works incredibly well. And, you know, 3 to 1 is, is also a nice light ratio. 4 to 1, 5 to 1, and 6 to 1 are medium ratios. And 8, 9, and 10 are high ratios, and they start to sort of become limiting. Now, in so that's the ratio game. The makeup game is like this. Really, auto makeup gain is sort of a digital phenomenon. However, <laughs> API sort of figured out how to do it in analog, and if you have the API vision console strip, when you use that compressor, even though it's analog, it has auto makeup gain. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. But usually on most musical vintage compressors, when you start doing lots of gain reduction, you notice the signal get quieter. And as the signal gets quieter, it kind of makes you feel like it's making it weaker. And sometimes it makes it hard for you to appreciate the compacting of the sound, the power that you're putting into the sound. So, so you have to manually guess what some of the gain reduction is and set it by hand. The nice thing about auto makeup gain, and it's in a lot of digital compressors, is um, as, you, as you make the adjustments to the threshold attack and release, the auto makeup gain is very carefully looking at the, the amount of gain reduction that it feels that is happening and it's adding it back to the output. So as you squeeze down on something, instead of it feeling like it's getting weaker, it feels like it's getting stronger. And um, good, using the phone. That, you know, you cannot be stopped, this technology. We'll, we'll sort you out, Mel. You're new, to, you're new to this new little online club. We'll get you all dialed in. These, you're here with some people who've been doing this for a minute, but... It is so good to see you. Okay, good. Um, use that phone. Um, so, uh, so now we know auto makeup gain also from limiters and you know maximizers, right? When we squeeze down on the threshold when we're mastering, or we're putting a bus limiter on the bus to preview what the master is going to be. As we pull down on that threshold, it's squeezing down. It's it's doing the limiting but it's adding that auto makeup gain that just makes it sound louder, louder, and bolder. So I'm a huge fan of the makeup gain. Let's look at auto release. Auto release is super cool. 
Um, auto release, like a fixed release, means that after the signal goes below the threshold, the compressor will wait this fixed amount of time to, to stop doing the gain reduction. And that works very good for very consistent kind of signals. Um, but for signals that are moving around, for the compressor to track that signal, is a fixed release sometimes some you know just is not your friend you know if you have a quantized snare that's programmed where every velocity is, is is straight then you can set a fixed release and it's great but if something's moving around on you like uh, a jazz vocalist or a, a solo guitar solo or anything where there's a lot of variety in the dynamics it's great to have the signal be able to be auto tracked by an auto release so um, that is auto release. And the knee is something that you don't always see on every compressor. But what the knee does is once the compressor is, you know, once the threshold is crossed and the gain reduction is kicking in uh, after the attack time, how quickly it goes to the ratio setting is the knee. And um, if it makes its way gently there over time, that's a soft knee. And if it kind of jumps directly to the ratio instructions, that's hard knee. Soft knee tends to be more transparent. Hard knee tends to be more limiting like. You almost have a sense of something knocking up against something. Um, and they're both very useful. You know, if you were doing... Um, some soft jazz singing, it would be soft knee for sure. But if you are doing some sort of compression on a picked guitar or maybe even uh, a kick or a snare, you may want to have it have that sensation that's knocking up or hitting against something. So in which case a hard knee is good. The super dope thing about Pro C2 is that it has a variable knee. And it's rare. Most times you have a hard knee or a soft knee, but not a variable knee. Another incredibly cool thing on Pro C2 is the range. And so what the range does is it can constrain the amount of gain reduction to a certain depth. It's like a depth limiter. So you can do lots and lots of compression but only have it affect, you know, stop at 1 dB of gain reduction or 2 dB of gain reduction or 3 dB of gain reduction. And this is very, very helpful when you're side-chaining, right? Side-chaining the, the bass and the kick. Um, the amount that it's ducking. You, you know, you have a threshold control, but then you can really fine-tune the, 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 the ducking amount with the range. Once you get, and it's something that you set typically last, and once you get good at it, it's just it allows you to dial in exactly um, the amount of downward compression that you're looking. And then finally, there is a super cool thing, this hold thing. And hold is, is, is something that they took out of Pro G, which we'll look at too, this month. Um, and gates are kind of complicated. They're funny. You think they're simple, but they're not. Uh, we'll get into our gating. And essentially, what it is, is it... The hold function um, delays the release by the amount of time determined by the hold, and it keeps the gain reduction in a level, steady place. And this is very, very useful in, on a couple things. Very, very useful, again, for sidechain compression, but also very useful for, like, a, a ducking effect where, you know, very, very typical for, like, radio announcers – when they're talking over music, that they want the music to come up and be big. So the music is big um, when they're not talking. But when they start to talk, the music automatically dips because it's triggered by a sidechain trigger by the voice. But what you don't want is when the, when, the, when the person's talking, for the music to rise up in between every syllable gets annoying. So when you lengthen the hold, it overrides the release time and keeps the game reduction steady so that you could talk over the music even take a little pause to breathe and the music's not rising up in those pauses but then when you're really finished talking the music ramps up 
right? So, so hold is very, very useful, especially for ducking stuff. All right, so let's do this. Let's go over to, um, back to logic, looking at proc2, and let's just kind of go through some of the other little things here. So here's the threshold, right? And you can see it visually. Below which no game reduction kicks in, above which the game reduction alert is triggered and game reduction will occur after the release time, right? So we can see the threshold here, very, very cool. And but below the threshold is the knee. And we can see the knee, there you go. That's a looks like a leg with a knee. So hard knee goes directly into the game reduction and a soft knee, there's a softer knee there, um, is got a rounded shape into the game reduction. And the cool thing is you can kind of do some in-between stuff and get it exactly right, which is very, very rare. Very, very few compressors have that. This is also super cool. This little headphone icon shows you can hear the portion of the signal that's being compressed. So if you it was like a wet, dry sort of thing, you could hear the wet signal, the compressed signal. And it's a very cool way to hear what's catching what's driving the compression what's what's what what or what part of the signal is being compressed is probably the better way of putting it um here's the ratio goes from one to one which is no compression at all don't don't sit there for hours compressing at one to one because there is no compression at one to one and if you notice look this is super cool from 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 the first half of the dial is lots and lots of resolution in the light you know uh ratio numbers and then it goes up to 100 you know like all that from 100 to to 20 like these are the high high ratios there's very little resolution there because you're not subtly fine tuning it but there's lots of resolution in the dial here in the light ratios, which allows you to really zero in on the light ratios and get a very light handed compression. Cool design, right? Nonlinear, super cool. Um, the attack is here and it's in seconds, uh, milliseconds, but it's a very program dependent compressor, this thing here. And I don't want anyone to get all mathematical with compression. It's, it's funny, it reverbs, you know, there's a little bit of math to reverb, but it never really works because the phrasing of the different elements and how that interacts with the compressor, you got to use your ears. I want everyone to sort of think about this as things are being fast, uh, medium, fast, and slow. And don't get hung up on the milliseconds um, because it's actually not all that helpful. Same with the release. Same thing here. Um, down, so we talked about the knee. Here's the range. And the range, again, I think the range, see how it defaults to all the way off in a sense? I think you want to you want to set your compression with the range here, and then you can constrain it and dial it back. And you'll, we'll see how that works. Look ahead in dynamics is super, super cool. And it's, they have some analog um, things that can sort of do it, but it is essentially a um, digital phenomenon. So you turn on look ahead here, and we'll see this a lot in, in the fab filter stuff. What does look ahead do? Look ahead uses the latency in the program. And when I say the latency, in Logic, for example, if we go to Audio Preferences, see this buffer size here, this I.O. buffer size? Um, when you're mixing and mastering, you want this to be at the highest value, whether it's Cubase or Pro Tools or Logic or Ableton. When you're, when you're composing, you want the low values because you don't want the latency. When you play your keyboard, you want to hear the sound right away. But when you're mixing and mastering, you want to give your DAW and your you know, computer, all of the processing headroom you can, you can have. And so we want this jacked up. Okay. So what does this do? When you hit spacebar and you're like, 
kick drum, are you ready? Snare, are you ready? Bass, you ready? Compressor, are you ready? Reverb, you ready? All right, play. You're giving the computer that buffer amount of time that I just showed you to get everybody all ready and dressed for school and out the door at the exact same time. And when I say at the exact same time, I mean sample accurate the same time. And that is no small thing when you're using third-party plugins that all have their own internal latency d depending on the processing. So this is why we give um, we give the, the, the computer the maximum amount of time to get the job done. Now, with Look Ahead, Look Ahead takes advantage of that buffer and can actually load the program material, the input signal, the snares, the kick, the vocal, whatever, into a buffer, and it can get in front of the transients in a way that analog sort of can only sort of can. And you can trick stuff, and you can... There's there's all good, really cool old analog tricks where you could have a like a ghost kick, you can have a ghost track, and then slide it earlier to make compression or gates open up on time. But we don't need to do any of that here. We can use the look ahead, which is so cool. So as you push the look ahead, you turn it on here. As you slide the look ahead forward, you can get in front of that snare hit. You can get in front of that kick and you can get in front of that guitar pick. Now, more is not better, contrary to American thinking. Uh, more is not always better. The right amount is the right amount. If you want for a kick to kick hard and you want that initial transient to have a smack to it, you don't want to get in front of it, right? That would sort of tame it too much. So so on kicks and snares that you want to have this the initial, initial transient really have a snap to it, um, you might try a tiny bit of look ahead or none. However, if you were dealing with a certain amount of using this as a ducking compressor, you might want that look ahead to see the transient that's triggering it and get there early and pull down ahead of time. And it might sound cleaner. So use this creatively. More is not better, but be aware of it. And it does certainly come in handy. And you can even see visually, as we look at the gain reduction visually here, you can see the compressor getting in front of the transient, which is really, really cool. Here's the hold, which we said smooths out from things releasing too quickly. And uh, here we have a wet gain and a wet pan. And this the outer pan can do some mid-side um, balancing, which can, you know, we'll, we'll, as we get a little bit more advanced this month, we'll do, we'll end it a little bit more We'll have some more kicked up tricks to come with some mid side stuff. The uh, dry gain is turned all the way down, but we can do parallel compression, right? And parallel compression, as we know, is to over compress something on purpose to get all of the little details of these little sounds that are getting masked by these more, by these bigger percussive moments, and then blending in some of that detail with the uncompressed signal. And it's great on vocals. It's great on lots of stuff. It adds lots of detail, but then you still have the dynamics. So we can play with those as well. And then the dry pan also has a, a mid-side balancing. Um, oversampling. Oversampling. You always want this on if your computer can take it. There's no, unlike look ahead, which sometimes may not be desirable, oversampling is never not desirable as long as it doesn't make your computer cry. And what oversampling does is it internally upsamples um, so that it can do more high resolution work and and not distort in and create aliasing. You know, we know when analog distorts, it distorts relative to the key of the song. And it distorts in, in musical intervals like fifths and fourths and octaves and stuff. When digital distorts, um, it distorts as a function of the sample rate, and it, in, it, it, it can't quantize things quickly enough, 
And the quantization errors make it put in fundamentals that are unrelated to the key of the song and they sound horrible. So this minimizes aliasing, which is the in injection into your signal of non-musically related um, harmonics that are yucky. So keep that cranked up if you can't afford two time, four times, do two times, but always turn that on if, if you can stand it. And then over here, sneaky hiding is a little gain structure balancing thing with it. You can do, you can adjust the input level, the output level, and balance the left, right input level and balance the left, right output level. And then finally, you have this cool bypass. This is the good bypass to use because it doesn't make your computer hiccup because of the way it deals with the buffering. Sometimes I think everyone will find when you bypass from here, um, it makes it can make the computer hiccup, kind of spaz out on you and throw things out of time. And you don't get as clean of an A being. So if you're really on top of your game, you're going to A B here, right? It's buffer free. You get a clean bypass. And then finally, almost finally, is this little slider here. And this is a cool wet dry mixer for a compressor. So you can compress it and then do a little bit of parallel compression right here, blending the compressed and the uncompressed. And you can also sort of hyper compress it and go up to 200% and make it even more compressed. Um, when you're setting this thing, keep this at, at 100 but then you can modify a little bit and it can be actually quite helpful. The metering is here. You can go super uh, zoomed in or zoomed out. I think for the most part, 9 dB is the best place to start. If you're doing 10 dB of gain reduction, that's a lot, you know. And usually you want to do something more subtle so you want to see better. So you do it like that. Um, now we go to the sidechain section here. And... You can have an internal or external sidechain, either one triggering. You can monitor the internal or external sidechain. And you can EQ the internal or external sidechain. So to do that, you click on the dot and you enable it here. And then we have these filters. And you can change the slope of the filter to very, very sharp or very gentle. In analog world, usually the 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 um, slope of the filter is 12 dB per octave. That's the way most equipment is built. That's what you're going to see over the last 50 years for the most part. 6 dB being gentle. But in digital, we can get much sharper and analog too. So you can play with that. Be warned a little bit. If you go crazy steep on some of this stuff, it's not always as musical as a little bit more of a gentle slope. But you do what you have to do. Um, and here we can turn this on. And um, I guess it's in auto mode now. And you, we can do some boosts. And boosting in the internal sidechain makes the compressor more sensitive to whatever frequency is boosted. Which means that it needs less energy to trigger gain reduction. And that you're sort of, you're encouraging <coughs> more gain reduction at those frequencies, even more than the input signal has. <coughs> what is this good for? Excuse me, is sometimes really bright sibilant stuff. You know, if you, if you, you know, if, if 6K, if something's kind of bright and a little painful, you can push up the 6K and the gain reduction will kick in uh, more quickly than it normally would make it when it's more sensitive to certain frequencies. So this is a cool um, way to, to sort of customize your compressor. And then similarly, it's critical with internal and external sidechain filtering that we do this for stuff like when we make the bass duck to the kick, we want a shorter trigger for the game reduction. And if you have, we have a fat subby kick, it's not going to make a tight enough side chain. So we can filter that. Or if we put this like on a drum bus or on a mix bus, 
we don't want the low frequencies causing the gain reduction, so we filter them out. Same with the ultra highs too. Sometimes we want to leave those uh, not triggering the gain reduction as well. So I do believe that that's the grand tour right there. So let's do a little bit of compression here. I'm going to, ah, one more thing. <laughs> okay, one more thing. Um, let's, let's look at the personalities here. Uh, and so, so again, one of the super cool things that they did here is that they gave us these different personalities, different behavior of the different compressors. So clean is feed forward. And feed forward means that, that the actual input signal directly causes the gain reduction. These are topologies or designs of compressors. So this is the fastest and the most reactive and the cleanest. Now, in the analog world, a lot of compressors are feedback style, feed forward as opposed to feedback. Feedback actually listens to the increase in the signal after the gain reduction circuitry. That sounds totally weird, like that could never work, but it actually does, and it makes this sort of codependent musical um, tracking of the signal that's really, really dope. So feed forward. The input signal exceeds the threshold. It triggers the gain reduction directly. C classic mode is feedback compressor. It's listening off of the back end of the compressor for voltage changes. And consequently, it is not as quick, and it allows some of the initial transients uh, to be un uncompressed, which makes for a little bit of a more percussive and sometimes more natural sounding percussive event. Clean jumps right into the game and can really take your transients right away, right away from you. Classic, because of that feedback style of compression, tends to allow for a little bit more initial transient energy. And it's like what most of the, the these compressors are. Opto. Now, opto, you see opto all the time, right? We see lots and lots of opto. Why do people love opto? Okay, here's why people love opto. This is why you see it in all kinds of wave compressors, all kinds of different compressors. Opto does this. If you're doing a light amount of gain reduction, opto releases quickly. And if you're doing like between 1 to 3 dB of gain reduction, if you're doing more than 3 dB of gain reduction, 5, 6, 7 dB of gain reduction, that's a lot, right? If you want to make something twice as loud, you turn it up 6 dB. That's like an audio bit of knowledge, right? Someone says, make it twice as loud. You turn up 6 dB, it's twice as loud. <clears throat> so, so if you're doing 6 dB of gain reduction, things are moving up and down by 6 dB. That's a lot. So what, what opto circuitry does is if you're doing a lot of gain reduction, it releases really slowly. It doesn't want to drop you. It doesn't want to let go and snap back to the uncompressed signal quickly because that would create pumping and breathing. Pumping and breathing can be a good thing. It can be very musical and it can provide a lot of energy. Um, but if you're looking for transparent compression, Opto has this really built-in cool release behavior that's smooth. So I'll say that again. If you're doing a little bit of gain reduction, it releases quickly, so you don't notice it. And if it, if you're doing a lot of gain reduction, it releases slowly, so you don't notice it. And it is probably my favorite personality for bass compression. Opto compression on the bass is a beautiful thing. Also can be nice on vocals. So that's the third um, personality. Here is vocals. And if you notice, the ratio just grayed out on me for vocals. I can't touch it. It's got this sort of auto ratio thing, and it almost goes into what we were talking about earlier today. It almost becomes at this point a musical compressor. 
right? When they take away uh, controls from us and they kind of auto the ratio, that's a little bit what an LA2A does or LA3A does or a Fairchild does. You know, as you drive it harder, the ratio changes automatically in a musical way. So this this vocal personality is very cool for vocals. It has, it's it's not mellow, you'll find. It's almost a little, reminds me a little bit of Arvox from Waves. It's a little, it's got a kind of, you know, you have a variable attack, but it's a bit grabby and it's a little limitery. Is that a word? Limitery? It is now. Um, so it can work very well, but don't feel that because it's a vocal, you have to use vocal. Don't do that. I use it sometimes, but I use clean, classic, opto uh, a lot on vocals, and it sounds great. I don't always use vocal and vocals. But try it out. It's got it's sort of a vocal limiter vibe in a way. Um, mastering is for mastering. And uh, it's it's gentle, but it, it, it has a grabby quality to it that may not necessarily work for EDM, right? In EDM, we're so protective. Um, and I'll take questions in a second. So, but go ahead and blurt them out so you don't forget them and we'll go back through them. In EDM, when we're compressing the master, we're so protective of our low frequency transients because if the low frequency transients get choked, people stop dancing and we need things to go boom, 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 boom. So we're, we're very, very careful, um, about using, things that are grabby and mastering. So although this is an interesting personality for mastering, uh, I don't, I typically don't use it for mastering. That's the honest truth. If I was doing some rock or some instrumental, you know, jazz or something, classical maybe could work. I don't know. It's a little grabby. So play with it. But if you find that it's too grabby for your bouncy house music, um, you're not crazy. I mean, you might be crazy, but th that's not, that's not why you're crazy. Um, for like me, crazy. Um, the bus one is very, very useful. This is the closest thing to the SSL G compressor in terms of personality. It's not grabby. And in fact, you're going to probably use this more in mastering than you would the mastering personality. That's just my opinion. Uh, it's more like a glue. It, it doesn't, it's not grabby and it doesn't release really quickly. It's roly poly and it's a fattening effect, a fat maker, which is really, really cool. Um, punch ha is, is got a personality where it's got an attack release personality that is a little grabby and releases quick. And it can make things kind of uh, hit very hard. Good for kicks and good for snares and claps and things that need to have a little knock to them. It's a very nice uh, one to try. And then pumping has, has got, here's a fancy word, hysteresis. Hysteresis is the speed of the decay of a signal. And when you increase the hysteresis or that, that drop down back to the uncompressed signal, when it's really fast, it can do a pumping effect. And again, pumping effects can really put energy into things in a way that is very, very cool. It's a little bit the opposite of this opto, right? This is by, doesn't want to pump, this wants to pump. So really start to master all of these, use them and flip through them where you end up, it does not matter, is absolutely personal to you, but be aware of them and play with them because it's almost like for your the price of one compressor, you have a rack of some technical compressors and then a couple kind of musical compressors in here. Very, very cool. Okay, so now let's do this. Let's, let's just do a little bit of acoustic picking. Everyone use this MixLR link I'm going to bypass this. I've got this soloed. I'm just using some Apple loops so that you can, you know, try this out instantly if you have logic. If not, you can sort of grab anything. 
Um, and, uh, and tell me if you can hear an acoustic guitar. Give me a Y in the chat if you can hear Good, good, good. Okay, beautiful. And I'll turn it up a little bit. Okay. So, so now, here's Pro C2. And here's our beautiful acoustic guitar. Uh, so, the way you get good at compression, because I promise they, you know, we're just starting out the month. We'll do all kinds of crazy mousetrap stuff. But I want to make sure that we're good with the basics because it's critical. Here's the best way to set up a compressor. Um, and it is to listen to the sound as we just did and then guess the settings and then make an adjustment one thing at a time, right? The thing that always throws people off with compression is that each one of these controls can increase or decrease the amount of compression, but it does it in a, in, in a very specific way. So now if this if this is going to be like solo guitar and vocal, I might allow it to be more dynamic just to, because there's not as many instruments so it can take up more of the space and be the star. If it's fitting into a dense mix, I may compress it more because it needs to fit in as a piece amongst many pieces. So let's pretend that, that it's in a, it's in a dense track and I'm going to set the compressor without it playing. One of the things that kind of screws people up is that they start to try to set the compressor with the sound going and it's almost like a house of mirrors. You sort of don't know what you're hearing. So the good engineers listen to the sound and then they guess. And so here's the guessing game. So for the attack, I it, this is a picky sound. It's not like a, a pad. It's got this picking and I want to control the picking a little bit. So I want a fast attack Forget about the numbers. <clears throat> I want a fast attack, but I don't want to choke it, right? I don't want to completely choke the sound. I want a little bit of percussive energy. If I go too slow, I'm, I'm going to miss those little picks. If I go too fast, I'm going to kind of give it like a bad facelift or something. It'll be like a face that's being stretched too hard or something. So I'm going to go for sort of like, I'm going to allow a little bit of attack time before the compressor kicks in, right? So I'm, allow I'm allowing a little bit of percussive energy. For the release, what do I want? Hmm, let me guess. If I go really fast, the compressor is going to let go maybe in the middle of a transient. Sound kind of unmusical, might get a little pumpy, a little strange. So cool. If I go too long, I'm over, it I'm making for too much of a compression on the sustain. I'd like a little bit of the musical sustain. So I'm guessing that I want to release somewhere around 12 o'clock or so. Auto gain is on. That's cool. And since this is a loop, I can probably set a release manually. If it was a crazy improvised performance, I might go for auto release. Um, but for this, I think I can dial in my release myself. Uh, look ahead. I'll try it. Let's turn it on. Oversampling, always good. We'll open up the sidechain filter for now, but we may not necessarily need it on this sound. And for the personality, uh, I'm going to go for classic. I'm going to go, I don't need to get there right as fast, I don't think, as for clean. I want a little bit of that initial percussive energy, so I'm going to go classic. I'm a classic, man. And uh, and now for the ratio, if I'm too mellow, even though the signal crosses the, the threshold, I'm not going to do enough compression. If I go too ham here, too crazy, then it's going to be a limiter. I'm going to go for a medium ratio on this one, like maybe a 4 to 1 ratio. Don't worry if it says 4.12. Don't go too crazy. Hard knee or soft knee, I think I want to be right in the middle. I want the range to be all the way off for now. And so now I've guessed. You see that? I did all this setting up, and this is what I want everyone to do and get good at. I swear, 
all the pros do this. They don't do this with the sound playing. It's, it's, it doesn't help you. Better to guess. And then now all I need to do is I'm going to make the threshold insensitive and I'm going to just ease into this threshold. Look, see how the, you know, my stuff is reacting. Auto gains on, so it's going to compact the signal and make it stronger as I go. And let's just see how good I guessed. And then I'll make adjustments one parameter at a time. All right. So what we can see there is we have gone for a more transparent style of compression and it, it doesn't scream, hey, you compress this. It actually makes it sound like the guitar player had a better performance. And that's why it is so important for me, for all of you not to hate compression, but to love it and to have it be your friend. And for you to can't wait to get up in the morning and have some coffee and go compress stuff. Um, because what it, for a control freak, like all of us must be, you know, to, to dial in all of these performances, even our own, to get the feeling from those performances you want, you can reshape a performance, a vocal performance, a guitar performance, anything, drum performance, to sound like it has more energy and to smooth out the playing. So here we've gone for a, we kind of guessed right, but I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, and we made for this really kind of thing. It didn't sound over compressed, but it sounded fatter. It sounded more energetic and less dynamic, but in a good way, right? So now there's a couple things. If it's, if, the, if it's too picky, if the pickiness is still too dynamic and I wanna make something less percussive, I go to the attack and I'll speed it up. If I want it to be even tighter, I can go to the look ahead and start to move this forward and if I want to even the tightest of tightest of compression here, I can go clean and this, this will get there right away. So let me just go from where we were to where we can go. And this is like, hey, I like it, but I really want to get the, that picking under control. It's, it's, it's too pokey. That's the word we use in compression. Too pokey. Too pokey, man.
Right. So so in other words, if I'm looking for a more compressed signal, I can do a number of things, each for a different reason. I can go for a faster attack to get there quicker. I can go for a slower release to hold it down longer. Um, and I can turn on the look ahead and get in front of the transient. And I can go to a harder knee for a quicker onset of the compression itself. Right. So so this this is this is really, uh, you know, compression, you know, some some boot camp of compression. But everyone has to be crystal clear uh, about all of this to go a little bit further into what we're going to do. So so let's do this. Let's go to uh, another sound. And we'll take questions in about five minutes. Uh, I just want to show another sort of take on this. So here we have a kick and let's throw a pro C2 on here. Now, you know, the question is, you know, when things are played by humans with microphones and stuff, compression is so critical because as we saw, it kind of, um, contains the performance it, it it can really compact the human differences in dynamics but what what do we use a technical compressor for on a programmed kick that every velocity is set every velocity is the same well at this point it really becomes an envelope tool right so if we have this kick here play it And there really isn't any dynamics to control per se, but we can use this as, a, as an envelope shaper. So if we turn this on uh, and it's a kick, um, it should be coming. Uh, and we, we, we'll do the guessing game again, uh, which is let's go for a attack, not the fastest. I don't want to choke my kick. I don't want to be too slow either. I won't get there in time. So let's go for, again, a medium, kind of medium fast attack. And we can always change it, but this, I'm doing my guessing routine, right? Release, I don't want to release too fast. I don't want to release too slow. So maybe something like a 9 o'clock release. For the personality, I'm going to start with classic uh, and maybe go to opto. But I'll try classic again. Variable knee in the middle is fine. Leave the range off for now. Um, look ahead. I don't really want look ahead on this one. I want the, the initial transient of the kick to smack through before I do that. So I'm going to leave that off. I will turn over sampling on for sure. Don't need any hold on this. And let's go ahead and open up the side chain here. And let's just do, and the ratio, I want it to be pretty light. So I'm actually going to go to 2.5. Four to one is, is, since we're really just doing some gentle envelope shaping, I don't want it to be too severe. So I'm going to go to 2.5, and I love 2.5. It's a really cool ratio. Uh, so now let's make the threshold all the way insensitive and just creep it up. And, you know, this, this envelope shaping that we're doing um, is, is making it sound like it's hitting harder. It's compacting the sound. It's just putting some energy into the sound. It's not controlling the dynamics. It's, 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 it's putting, injecting some energy into the, into the sound. So now what we might want to do is leave 
have the lows be uncompressed and not triggered by the um by by the lows in the internal side chain so that it's really sort of just reacting to the mid range and so we can sort of slide this up and we'll we should hear the low end come up a little bit when we do this And there you go. Um, super, super easy. And you'll notice, and it might be hard to hear during the broadcast today, but when you watch this later um, in your hammock, uh, you will hear that, that, that having the low frequency triggering the compression of the kick choke the kick. And, and by sliding this up, all of a sudden the low frequency really starts to uh, be free and be more dynamic and you get a much more dynamic low frequency bounce. So, so, and this little trick is what we're going to be doing when we listen, when we work on a whole track, um, you know, we will use pro C2 here as a bus compressor. Come here, you. And this, this will, and we'll get into this again next week. We'll sort of, continue next week with the more some more even more advanced tricks um but but when we put this on the whole mix we're going to go to bus because it sounds great we don't want to choke our kick right so we can slow down the attack maybe not all the way slow but pretty slow and speed up the release we, we know from today slow attack fast release makes for a lightly compressed signal we're in bus mode, but then the critical thing, of course, oversampling is on, and we're not going to really need look ahead on this. We go to the side chain here, and we're going to definitely, when we put this on the whole mix bus, uh, as our little bus compressor hug, uh, we're going to definitely punch in the internal side chain low cut or high pass filter and dial this up maybe up to three or four hundred and this makes for quite a nice mix bus compressor right very 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 light ratio here okay so uh i know this might have been a little basic but i think it'll be cool reference uh just in terms of boot camping compression in the context of pro c2 and i will take questions in two minutes what is really important to me is that you master this plugin because this plugin for technical compression is the best one available. Um, it has so many different personalities and um, it, it it's so flexible. It's so clean and transparent, but it will put so much energy in your mix by compacting some of these, these signals and, and hardening them up. You don't have to over compress them but a, a judicious amount of compression on individual elements and on your buses is what, where the power comes from. That is, you know, that compression, sorry, that saturation limiting is really where the power comes from. And let me, let me just throw in one more thing and we'll pick this up again next week, which is this, this slider, which I didn't really show in the beginning, but I want to show now this, this is side chain level. So you, you have a gain control, if your sidechain level is too loud for your from your external sidechain or your internal sidechain, you can actually, it's cool to have a little level control to push the sidechain harder or mellow it out. So that's your sidechain level. The stereo link, this is critical. If you're use if you have a very stereo sound, like really wide stereo guitars or a crazy silent 
patch or a Nexus 2 where they're like you listen to this the synth patch and it's crazy crazy stereo make sure you go into sidechain otherwise it's hiding hiding from you and unlink the detectors we're going to do this with the pro sdser and we're also going to do this with pro l which we're going to do next week as well you know i for a long time i just slept on unlinking my stereo compressors i left them linked just kind of out of ignorance and as soon as i started to unlink my stereo compressors I got a much, much wider stereo image from my very stereo tracks. What is it doing? Well, you know, in a stereo compressor, there's a, there's a left and right detector. If you have a center image, like a lead vocal in the center, and you're mastering, you don't want to unlink the detectors too much because if a transient happens on the left and the left channels independent and the gain reduction pulls down the left but leaves the right momentarily intact the lead vocal will swing the center image will swing from side to side and i i'm sure that you will get a call from rihanna's manager if rihanna's vocal is is auto panning like pan man from the left and the right right we don't want that so in order to prevent that we have what we call a stereo link detector for compression, which means the left is listening to the left and the right, and the right is listening to the left and the right. So if anything happens anywhere, they both come down equally. And that keeps the, Rihanna's vocal in the center. That's cool for that particular thing. But if I have a sick Nexus patch with like mad stereo information, I don't have Rihanna in the center. I have just this wonderful, bubbly, left-right loveliness. And I, I will, I, if I want to preserve all that difference, I unlink the stereo compressor, right? And if I'm mastering, I can unlink them a little bit as long as Rihanna isn't pan-manning around on me, right? If she's staying in the center, it's cool. So we'll see on in DSing and on the Pro-L limiter, not to give away next week's lesson we'll do you know just little bits of unlinking but please don't sleep on this um if you're using a compressor on a track that is very very stereo unlink it and you're going to be like especially put some headphones on you'll be like holy man did that just get wider without using a fake artificial widener okay so that is the that is the presentation for today um you know the fundamentals of Pro C2.